a little bit about exactly what lifestyle medicine is, some definitions, um, some of the science behind lifestyle medicine, uh, and how the lifestyle medicine movement is growing. Uh, and then from there, um, I want to talk about this disease reversal promise. So uh, what specifically do we do to reverse disease in lifestyle medicine? And then uh, at the end, finish up with some ideas of what Fiji as a country uh, and, and other countries in the South Pacific and really around the world uh, can do. So this is the definition of lifestyle medicine the one that I like the most. And I want to highlight some of the things here that are, so first is evidence-based. So lifestyle medicine is not alternative medicine. It's not some idea that somebody's thought up um, that they want to play with. It's, it's actually coming from the science and it's coming from, from epidemiologic science. So there are studies of hundreds of thousands of people that show that lifestyle medicine works. So it's evidence-based. Um, it works for individuals and it works for communities. And we'll talk at the end how the big win for lifestyle medicine is actually when you apply it to a whole community, or in the case of Fiji, I think it can be applied to the whole country. We'll talk in the details about what lifestyle medicine is, but it's focused on underlying causes. Uh, so it's really looking at that root cause uh, and it promises, as Dr. Kuma has talked about, prevention, treatment, and even reversal. I just wanted to compare lifestyle medicine to some of the other terms that are out there. So allopathic medicine, that's the medicine that I was taught as a physician. It's the medicine that most physicians around the world now are taught. Um, and it really focuses on drugs and surgery. So it's, it's, uh, that's, that's what allopathic medicine is about. Alternative medicine are things that are not conventional. The, there's, some many, there's some good things about alternative medicine. But I would say the problem is it's not really scientifically based. So when you uh, apply alternative medicine, you don't know for sure that it's going to work or not work. Integrative medicine tries to, to bring alternative and allopathic medicine together, all different types of medicine. Functional medicine is something that's growing a lot in the United States. It's looking at the physiology and applying uh, really a lot of supplements and other kinds of things. And then lifestyle medicine is what we're talking about here tonight. This is a slide. This is probably my favorite slide. I show this slide to all of my patients. What this slide illustrates is that treatment comes in at different levels. When I was trained in medical school, I was trained to do this, allopathic medicine, prescribe medications, do procedures. And in fact, we built healthcare systems around doing this. But if you look at the disease burden, not just in Fiji, not just in the United States, but really around the world, the disease burden is lifestyle-related diseases. And if the burden is lifestyle-related diseases, it feels like we ought to build our healthcare system starting down here. So I tell people, if you're building a house and you want that house to be three stories tall or, or some large building, you want it to be three stories tar, tall, if you go to a builder, would you like that builder if the builder said, I do second and third floors, I do those really, really good, I do these second and third floors at a world-class level, but I don't really do first floors. I might help you a little bit with that, but you have to come with the foundation. You have to do the foundation all on your own. Uh, once you've got the foundation, come and talk to me more and I'll help you uh, build your house. Would you go to that builder to build your house? Probably not, but that's what we're doing with our healthcare system. We're, we built this healthcare system that has that second and third floor, but it's not built on, this, uh, uh, on these lifestyle medicine diseases. So lifestyle medicine has four pillars. There's a variety of different ways you can define it, but I, I like to think about the four pillars. We have on the side here, New Start. The first pillar is, I use the term nourishment. And if you look at New Start, it includes nutrition, it includes water, it also includes, a, there's a, a T over there for temperance. So that's alcohol and tobacco. So nourishment is anything that's coming into your body. So you have to, to be aware of that. When we're talking about diabetes, uh, this is probably the key uh, component as far as diabetes. 
So the second component is um, we use the term movement. So it's uh, nourishment is how you bring energy into your body. Uh, movement is how you uh, expend energy. So it's exercise. It's not sitting too much. Um, it's a variety of different ways of staying active. The next term that we use is the term resilience. And resilience uh, is sleep and stress. In my practice, I find they're very connected. So if you're very stressed, you don't sleep well. Um, and that's very important as far as uh, reversing chronic diseases. In fact, for my patients, if they're not sleeping well, I focus on that first. Because if, you, if you're not sleeping well, it's hard for the rest of your body to do well. And then the final component, the final pillar of lifestyle medicine is connectedness. Uh, so we, we do best in communities, we heal best in communities, and lifestyle medicine is best applied in communities. Lifestyle medicine is relatively new. It's, it's something, like I said, the, the first text in lifestyle medicine was actually published in 1999. So it's been talked about for a couple decades now. But the idea is really just becoming more common over the last four or five years. But you can see back in 2012, so six years ago, the American Medical Association said lifestyle medicine interventions should be the first and primary mode of preventing and treating chronic diseases. So it's relatively new, but it's being adopted and being recommended by some of the, the larger medical societies around the world. So there are lifestyle medicine competencies. So the field has been uh, defined, and I won't go into these in detail, but this is a list of, of 15 lifestyle medicine competencies. So if you're uh, training healthcare providers, you can train them around these specific competencies. These have been turned into a variety of different curriculum. Uh, many of these are online. And in this curriculum, we, we talk about nourishment and movement and uh, resilience. Uh, we talk about uh, cessation of tobacco and alcohol. We talk about coaching. If you want to do lifestyle medicine well, you need to understand how to help people change behavior because changing behavior doesn't necessarily come easy. So there, there are tools and mechanisms and skills that need to be developed uh, to help people change behavior. In the US, we have the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. This is an organization that I helped uh, start uh, about 14 years ago. And again, it remained very small for many years. But this is a growth pattern. So down here, 2010, 2011, 2012, it had one, two, 300 people. Uh, now it's uh, almost 2,500 people uh, that have joined. And these are uh, primarily doctors, um, but it's also health professionals, many other types of health professionals. So this is a growing field in the United States. It's also a growing field around the world. Uh, Dr. Kuma referenced the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance. The head of the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance is actually a Kiwi, so she's from, from uh, the South Pacific herself. Um, and uh, there are multiple countries around the world that are saying this is what lifestyle medicine is. Uh, so these are just lists, uh, different continents, different countries around the world. And of course now we have the South Pacific Society of Lifestyle Medicine, so I'm excited to be here at the inaugural, at the launching of the South Pacific Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And I have a lot of hope for what this does for, for the country of Fiji, for the other countries here in the South Pacific. One of the things that I'm most excited about and privileged to be a part of is certification in lifestyle medicine. So we knew as, we, as the field of lifestyle medicine was developing, that there are many people out there that will say, I do lifestyle medicine, I do lifestyle medicine, uh, and not all of them are practicing in that evidence-based way. So you can bring a lot of uh, voodoo, a lot of uh, different kinds of non-scientific uh, tools to the table. So we wanted to certify and differentiate between the people that were doing it the evidence-based way and the people that were doing it uh, the non-evidence-based way. So we started the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, and then we started the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. These are the tests that have been done just in the last year. So the very first board certification in lifestyle medicine was October of 2017. So it's, it's not even a year old. We've already, though, done tests in the United States. Um, in Sydney was the second test. In Manila, Philippines was the third. And then in Edinburgh, Scotland was the fourth test. 
We've now revised the test and we're starting the second round. Uh, the first test in the second round was Brisbane, Australia. And you can see there's tests coming up uh, more in the United States, uh, several in South America, uh, another one in Europe, uh, one in the Middle East, uh, one in India coming up December of this year, uh, another one in Seoul. Uh, with any luck, we'll have some out here in the South Pacific uh, at some point in the near future. So this, this field of lifestyle medicine is growing, it's growing rapidly, and it's growing because of this chronic disease epidemic that is not felt just uh, in the South Pacific, but all the way around the world. So what's the promise of lifestyle medicine? What, are, what can we actually say about disease reversal? This is something called the Diabetes Prevention Program. This was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine February of 2002. So this is 16 years old. Uh, this study, 16 years old since it was published, so 20 years since the research was actually done. So in this study, they took people who were pre-diabetic, uh, so people who had a high hemoglobin A1C but not high enough yet for diabetes. And they divided them into three groups. Uh, one group was the placebo group, so those, that group got regular care. The second group was the medication group, so, so they got metformin, the most common type of diabetes medication. And then the third group was the lifestyle group. So the lifestyle group got intensive training around how to eat healthy, uh, how to exercise. And then they started following these people. They, they kept them uh, in their groups. And you can see one year, two year, three years, four years. They got to four years and they saw that the lifestyle group was 58% lower chance of developing diabetes. So 58% less people. So you can see about, uh, in this lifestyle group, still a little less than 20% were developing diabetes. But the placebo group was close to 40% that was developing diabetes, a 58% uh, drop in the lifestyle medicine group. It was so significant that they had to stop the study. They, they said, ethically, we can't continue doing this study. Uh, we need to give everybody lifestyle. So they thought this study was going to be a 20-year study, but they had to stop it after four years because of the lifestyle. So we knew that you could prevent diabetes um, from lifestyle. Now, it took the United States 16 years, so from when this published study was published until this year, 2018, the U.S. government is now paying for this diabetes prevention program, but it, but it took that long. Uh, so hopefully here in Fiji, you all can move quicker uh, than we did in the United States. So we're talking mainly about diabetes and diabetes reversal tonight, but I just wanted to share statistics about a few other chronic diseases. So this is high cholesterol. Um, this is a study done by David Jenkins in, in Canada. And again, he took people with high cholesterol and divided them into three groups. There was a placebo group, uh, a medication group, which is uh, the sort of diamonds here, and the, a lifestyle group, which is the triangles. So he put them on this uh, aggressive medication, um, which is just mainly high fiber foods. And you can see within two weeks, within two weeks, they dropped their cholesterol by 30%. Two weeks dropped their cholesterol by 30%. That's impressive. And what's impressive is that the lifestyle did it as well as the medications. What do you think has the more risk, the lifestyle or the medications? And, and if you can do it with the lifestyle as well as you can do it with the medications, why wouldn't you choose the lifestyle? So we've been talking about CHIP. This is some data from CHIP. This is data um, of a, close to 5,000 people that was published in the American Journal of Cardiology uh, by Paul Rankin and some of his colleagues out of Australia. And what you can see, CHIP is a 30, this was a 30-day program. Um, I don't know how long CHIP can be implemented over a variety of different ways, but this was implemented over 30 days. Um, and people who had the highest levels of cholesterol dropped their cholesterol by 20%. In fact, if you look at this here, beginning 126 had high cholesterol, the end only 30. So almost everybody who had high cholesterol got out of that, that high range by the end of their CHIP program. Same thing with uh, diabetes, the, the fasting blood glucose that was in the diabetic range. Uh, close to half of them were outside of the diabetic range by the time the study was over or by the time the 30 days was over. And triglycerides, you can see the highest levels of triglycerides actually dropped 44%. So impressive study in a relatively short period of time. 
and this was, this was not in the healthcare system. So these were lay people that were implementing this CHIP program. One of the things that's nice about lifestyle medicine, doctors like to be able to trust what they prescribe. They like to be able to say, if I prescribe this, I know I'll get the results. This shows that with the CHIP program, the CHIP, CHIP is what's called an intensive lifestyle change program. It shows that you can trust the results. So if you look here, these are different CHIP studies published at different times, published with different populations. So there's uh, about 30 different publications that have come from CHIP in the scientific literature. And you can see here, the numbers vary a little bit, but the average is a little over five uh, millimeters of mercury that their systolic blood pressure has dropped. And it's consistent results from one study to the next. You can do the same thing with uh, cholesterol. Again, the average is around 12 or so uh, points. Uh, this is using the American system of, of measuring cholesterol, dropping it about 12 points, uh, which is an impressive drop uh, for LDL cholesterol. Again, consistent results. They'll vary a little bit from study to study, but you know that you can get these results as long as people apply these lifestyle medicine changes. So one of the things when I talk with doctors, one of the things that the doctors will say to me is, well, you can, you can educate people about lifestyle, but they don't keep doing it. Uh, it, it doesn't really stick. So this is a study that looks at uh, people who had a heart attack. So they had a heart attack, they were scared. If you have a heart attack, that's a very scary thing. And the doctor said, you need to be on three medications uh, so you don't have another heart attack. So they were started on these three medications, statins uh, to lower cholesterol, beta blockers uh, to slow the heart rate down, and ACE inhibitors to work on their, their kidneys and also to help with their blood pressure. <laughs> and you can see, as time went on, the percent of people that were taking the medications gradually dropped. In fact, if you look at about 18 months, it was about 70% of the people that were still taking the medication. So um, there, were, there was reasonable medication compliance, but about 70% uh, only were still doing it. So 30% of people, even though they were scared after their heart attack, they said, I just can't keep taking this medication or I don't want to keep taking this medication. So this is, again, data from CHIP. This is a study where they looked at the different things they asked people to do in CHIP. So physical activity, eat more vegetables, decrease saturated fat, increase the, the fiber in your diet. And they looked at those people 18 months out, and you can see the percent that were still doing that 18 months out was, guess what? About 70%. So we don't have perfect compliance with lifestyle medicine. 70% compliance 18 months out, but guess what? It's no worse than medication. And again, if you could choose medication versus lifestyle medicine, getting that same compliance rate, and, and I personally believe, based on my practice, that, that lifestyle medicine really applied well will get about 80% compliance. So we don't get 100% um, compliance with lifestyle medicine. Um, in the United States, we have uh, problems with smoking, but we've done a great job of changing the culture around smoking, but still about 15 or 20% of the population smoke. So, so we'll still have those problems with lifestyle, but I believe we can get 70, 80% of people um, to reverse their diseases if we apply lifestyle uh, correctly. So the publications on the reversal of diabetes in lifestyle medicine are relatively new. So this was a publication by uh, Lim. He's from England. This was published in October 2011. It's the first paper that actually talked about the word reversal with diabetes. So he said uh, in, in his program, type 2 diabetes was reversible by reducing dietary energy intake. He did a follow-up study, which I think is, is very interesting. This one was published in 2013. And this is what he found um, in, in his program. And, and actually, his application of lifestyle medicine wasn't using all the science that we currently have as far as applying lifestyle medicine. But you can see here, in, in this group of people, um, which was about 77 people, People who had diabetes for a short period of time had a very high reversal rate, so 73%. People who had it a little longer, 
not quite as high, about 56%. And if you had diabetes for a long period of time, uh, only 43%. So it's, it's harder to reverse the longer you've had diabetes. So if you, if you have diabetes or prediabetes, or if you have friends or family members who have diabetes or prediabetes, uh, please talk to them about how important it is to do it now, not to wait till next year or till three years from now. So um, again, he talked about reversal. And, and said diabetes reversal should be a goal in the management of type 2 diabetes. This is a, a more recent study. This is again out of England, and it's some of the same people that were involved in, in the previous studies. Uh, and what they did in this study is they went to primary care doctors and, and said, we want you to apply things like the diabetes prevention program to your patients that already have diabetes. So they had two groups, a control group and an intervention group. Um, and uh, the control group got usual care. The intervention group uh, had very significant uh, transitions or, or uh, interventions in their diet. And this is the data they got. So this is weight loss. The control group basically didn't lose weight. But the intervention group, 24% of them lost at least 15 kilograms. So 24% of the population lost at least 15 kilograms. This is uh, reversing diabetes, so diabetes actually going into remission, and at 12 months, the control group, a few of them had actually reversed diabetes, but look at this, 46% of the control group, I mean, of the intervention group had reversed diabetes, 46%. And look at this, this is comparing people who lost weight and reversed the diabetes. So the, the people that lost over 15 kilograms 86% of them reverse diabetes. So there's a, a direct correlation between the weight loss um, and the diabetes reversal. So this is a, a patient from my practice. So I'm a practicing physician in the U.S. I spend most of my time seeing patients. And um, I had a patient that came in with a hemoglobin A1C of 13. So that's way high. That's scary high. Um, and uh, she wanted to, to join our diabetes reversal program. So we have a diabetes reversal program. It uses CHIP. It uses a variety of other uh, inter interventions. And it lasts for 12 weeks in length. In the end of the 12-week program, this was her statistics, hemoglobin A1C was down to 6.6. .6. So she halved her hemoglobin A1C in, in 12 weeks. And she did that with no medications whatsoever. So this was purely lifestyle. It was purely diet and exercise and uh, connectedness and the various things that we do in our uh, reversal program. She also dropped weight. Um, she, was, she had a BMI of 30 starting off, and she dropped it to 26.5. So she was not that overweight, but she was a little overweight. Uh, she dropped her diabetes, um, and she was changed. You could just tell um, that... that her life was different now. And to me, that's the exciting thing. That's the, the thing that makes it worthwhile is when you just see this energy that develops in people. So this is the diabetes reversal program that we have. Um, it includes visits with, with our physician, one of our physicians. It includes visits with our dietitian. It includes visits with our health psychologist, working on health behavior change. It includes coaching calls. So we, we have our coaches interact with these people regularly throughout the 12 weeks. Uh, they watch all the CHIP videos, and they do that at home. So they do it online at home watching the CHIP videos. We have a support group, and they're asked to come to the support group at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. We have cooking classes, and we have a variety of other educational things. So they participate in that. Um, and then we do physiologic testing, so we test things like their hemoglobin A1C and their blood pressure and their cholesterol before and after. Again, the program lasts 12 weeks. The patients are asked to commit six to eight hours per week on this program. So it's not an easy program. You have to be committed to it. You have to really uh, um, say, this is something I want to do. And we let people start at any time. So a patient can walk in. We can start them uh, the very next Monday on our diabetes reversal program. So what exactly happens? What exactly do you do to reverse diabetes? So this is, this is the slides that, uh, that really talk about what we do as far as uh, changing nutrition. And it's primarily nutrition. I consider diabetes type 2 to be a foodborne illness. Um, it's, it comes from our food, and we can reverse it with our food. So this is a very important slide. And I just want to point out here, 
So what they did in this slide is they looked at the correlations between the types of food people ate and whether they developed type 2 diabetes. And if you're a scientist, you know that an R of 1 means a perfect correlation. So that means everyone that did that developed diabetes. So no, there was no perfect correlation, but dietary fat and corn syrup had very high correlations. So 0.84 for fat and 0.83 for corn syrup. So we know that dietary fat and simple carbs, corn syrup is an example of a simple carb, dietary fat and simple carbs are the two things that you want to stay away from uh, if you have diabetes. We have two other R's that are 0.71 and 0.75. So that's protein intake and total energy intake. So those are correlations as well, but not as strong as the fat and the simple carbs. So the total calories in makes a difference, and how much protein you take in makes a difference too. Uh, so you have to think about all of that. But again, the most important th thing to think about is fat and, um, and simple carbs. Now, regular carbohydrates, an R of 0.55. So that says it really doesn't matter. So you can eat a lot of regular carbohydrates and that doesn't seem to be correlated with diabetes. It's these simple carbs that make the difference. And then they looked at fiber and fiber has an R that's closer to zero, which means it's a negative correlation, which means the more fiber you eat, the better off you are. So the, the summary of this is we want to have less dietary fat, less simple carbs and more fiber. So let's look at some of these in detail. So what's the problem with fat? Well, one of the problems with fat is fat, didn't mean to do that. Um, fat is the most calorie dense food ingredient out there. So if you look at carbohydrates, if you look at proteins, and if you look at fat, fat is where you get more calories per gram than any of the others. So it's, it's actually over twice as much. So this is a stomach that's filled with 400 calories of pure fat. So this is oil, 400 calories of oil. This is a stomach that's filled with 400 calories of beef. So beef has protein in it, but it also has a high percentage of fat. So again, the stomach is just partially full. If you take the same stomach and fill it up with 400 calories of vegetables, it's chock-a-block full. So who's going to fill the most satiated, the most full at this point? Well, if your stomach is full, it's stretching and, and you're going to feel more full with those vegetables. So we think about, uh, a lot of people think about carbohydrates being bad and they think about high sugar items being bad. And many people say that fruit is high sugar, so you need to be careful with that. So this is a study that looked at fruit and diabetes. And the summary of the study was... Um, People who had 320 grams of fruit a day, so quite a bit of fruit a day, versus people that had 130 grams of fruit a day, so about a third the level. So these people were eating three times as much fruit as these people. At the end of three months, didn't change anything. Didn't change their weight, didn't change their, their abdominal girth, didn't change their hemoglobin A1C. So there's not a correlation between fruit. What's the difference between fruit and those simple carbs that we talked about that were bad? two things. First off, fruit has fiber. So when you're eating the whole fruit, you're getting that fiber, so that's okay. Um, and the second is the sugar in fruit comes in a natural way. So if you're eating a processed sugar, that's what, the, what gets you in trouble. It's, if it comes in a natural form uh, with that fiber around it, then fruit tends to not be so bad. So fiber is very important. In fact, in, in our practice, when we have people go through the diabetes reversal program, we try to get them up to 40 to 45 grams of fiber a day. And I don't know what the, the data is here in Fiji, but if you look at the data in the United States, it's about 10 to 15 grams of fiber is what the average American eats. So we're asking them to triple their fiber intake. What are the best sources of fiber? Well, fiber is all plant-based, so you, you don't get uh, any fiber from dairy or eggs or meat. You, you have to eat plants. And if you look at the plant-based sources of fiber, the very best 
is legumes. So beans. Um, I was pleased when I arrived here to see that dal was, uh, was common here. Um, that's that's a, a good source of legumes. Uh, so that's the best source of fiber, but it also is found in fruits. It's also found in vegetables. Um, it's found in grains. A lot of people think that grains are the best source of fiber, and grains are a good source of fiber, uh, but it's the fruits and the vegetables, and especially the beans, that we really use to push um, for uh, fiber. So what are the specific foods that we talk about? We already talked about it's the simple carbs and the fats that are bad, and it's the, the fiber that's good. So let's look at this in a little more uh, detail. So simple carbs... There's two main sources of simple carbs. The first source is processed sugars. So that's what's found in, in soft drinks. That's what's found in candies and cakes. Uh, a lot of the packaged goods that you, that you will get in a, in a fast food or a convenient uh, thing is, is going to have these processed sugars. So it's anything that ends in os. Um, and artificial sweeteners, so if you think the Diet Coke is better than the, the regular Coke, it's actually not. Um, it doesn't... <laughs> doesn't help you much at all. I heard a lot of uh, sad sighs with that. Uh, sorry, sorry to disappoint you. So processed sugars, but also processed flours um, make a difference too. Uh, in the United States, and I hear that it, it's happening some here in Fiji as well, um, there's people that are talking about the ketogenic diet and, and using the ketogenic diet to lose weight and to uh, reverse diabetes. And the ketogenic diet does help some because the ketogenic diet tends to take out these processed flours and to some extent these processed sugars too. Those are very important things if you want to reverse diabetes. So that's why the ketogenic diet uh, works at least some. But the second thing that you need to do if you really want long-term reversal of diabetes is to, is to cut out saturated fats. And unfortunately, the ketogenic diet does that. So even though there's some early data as far as the ketogenic diet helping some, it doesn't really help in the comprehensive way that really fully applied <laughs> lifestyle medicine uh, does. So where are saturated fats? The biggest source of saturated fats in the US is cheese. Uh, so I don't know if cheese is eaten much in the, in the diet in Fiji, but that's, that's a, a huge source. But saturated fat is also found in red meats and in chicken. Um, so actually most any meat product has saturated fat. Fish, fish is the healthiest meat, so, so that's uh, uh, the, the one that you worry about the least. But most other um, animal fats uh, you, you want to stay away from. You also want to stay away from the processed fats, the trans fats. Uh, they're found in a lot of margarines and, and uh, these are the, the the fats that are used to stabilize fat so that it uh, stays in a, a more solid form. Uh, so you, you stay away from the partially hydrogenated oils. Uh, in the United States, these are eliminated more and more. Um, hopefully the same thing is happening in Fiji. And then there's uh, there are certain vegetable oils that have, um, this is not saturated fat, this is polyunsaturated fats, but these are harmful polyunsaturated fats. So it's found in uh, corn oil, Soybean oil, peanut oil, uh, those are some oils that we try to stay away from as well. Actually, we try to stay away from any oil to some extent, um, but these are some of the less healthy oils. And then where do we get the fiber? Again, we, we talked about that some in an earlier slide, but legumes, uh, beans, lentils, garbanzos, those are the, the best sources of fiber. And I, and I see just in, in my short time here in Fiji, those are easily available here. Vegetables, um, any vegetable, especially your dark green leafy vegetables, um, but eggplant, okra, sweet potatoes, those are all uh, great sources of fiber. Um, so eating those on a regular basis in the whole food form. So if you're peeling the skin off your potato, that's not as good as keeping the skin on and eating the skin as well. Um, fruits. Uh, figs, pears, raspberries, there's a variety of fruits that are high in fiber. And then whole grains, uh, brown rice, uh, so there's more, way more fiber in brown rice compared to white rice. Um, quinoa, oatmeal, uh, those can be great sources of fiber. So this is just to give you a sense. Um, when. When we're doing our diabetes reversal program, usually if, we're, if someone's in the middle of that 12-week program, 
we ask them to go vegan. We ask them to go completely plant-based. You don't necessarily have to be completely plant-based for the rest of your life once you get your diabetes reversed. But if you're actually trying to reverse your diabetes, so if, if you, um, someone, some of you sitting in the, in the room or, or uh, friends or neighbors or family members want to reverse your diabetes, I would highly encourage you to do something like CHIP where you actually tend to go 100% plant-based or vegan at least for a period of time. Uh, maybe not forever, but, but you need that to get that reversal going. Um, so this, this looks at people who long-term eat vegan, people who long-term eat lacto-ovo, people who long-term um, have a little fish in their diet, uh, semi-vegetarian is they eat meat every once in a while, and these people you know, eat meat the way the typical Americans do. So this was a study done of, of, uh, of um, Seventh-day Adventists in the, in the United States. And obviously the people that, that were vegan had way less diabetes than the people who eat meat uh, in a typical way. So how do you reverse diabetes? An intensive, aggressive, supported treatment program that decreases or eliminates processed and animal foods and increases fiber provides the best chance of success in diabetes reversal. Processed foods is what decreases those, um, those simple carbohydrates and to some extent the saturated fats and the animal foods is what decreases the, the saturated fats primarily. So what can we do about this diabetes epidemic um, that's going on here in Fiji, that's going on in the South Pacific, that's also going on around the world? Well, the real win is if we change our culture. That's, that's really how we'll do this. So what can we do to change our culture? One thing that we can do is go back to traditional diets. Um, traditional diets didn't have processed foods. Traditional diets had way less meat than the, the typical diet uh, that's, that comes with sort of this Western way of eating. So we need to, to go back to that traditional diet um, uh, and make that easier and simpler. And how do we do that? Well, first I just wanted to point out, I did a little research before I came here. Uh, this is strategic pillar 1.1.1. So this is the first thing in the Fiji Ministry of Health strategic plan. Reduce key lifestyle risk factors. So this is something that a lot of people here have been thinking about for many years um, and, and working on. Uh, and I'm pleased to, to offer lifestyle medicine as one of the new tools that's available uh, for reducing these lifestyle risk factors. So one of the things we need to do is we need to train our health professionals differently. If, if you're trained as a health professional in the top part of that triangle, you don't really know how to prescribe lifestyle. You don't really know how to get someone to change their health behavior. You don't know uh, how to, to get them to decrease certain foods and increase certain foods. Uh, you don't know the science and you don't have the skill. Uh, so this is a, a from, from the United States, but it shows that we do a terrible job in the United States of training people uh, in nutrition and lifestyle. Um, and I think that's true, to be honest, around the world to a large extent. So we have to change medical education. We need to, to organize and have societies. So I'm so pleased that the South Pacific Society of Lifestyle Medicine is being started as an organization, as a, as a place that works on all of these things together. We need to work with corporations. So this is a corporation in the US. It's uh, Cummins Engines. So if, if you drive a big truck, you likely have cum, a Cummins engine in, in that truck. Um, and Cummins has... Uh, thousands of employees around the world and they said our health care costs are, are one of our biggest impediments in being successful. So they, they built this beautiful lifestyle center. Uh, they have all their employees come to the center uh, and they're already seeing better outcomes. They're seeing the disease reversal. So they're applying lifestyle medicine. They're using actually CHIP in their corporation. Um, and they're seeing the disease reversal that lifestyle medicine promises, and they're seeing decreased healthcare costs uh, that lifestyle medicine promises. So we need to work with companies. Um, we need to work within the healthcare system. So this is, is hot off the press. This was actually three days ago, August 29, 2018, four days ago. 
um, Bellevue Hospital in New York. Uh, so they're applying lifestyle medicine. They're applying this aggressive uh, plant-based uh, disease reversal uh, types of things. And they're investing $400,000 in it because the way healthcare finance is in the US, um, if they can reverse disease, they, they make more money. Um, so the, the, the government reimbursement, uh, they do better um, doing disease reversal. So they're willing to, to make a large investment uh, in applying this type of thing. So we have to work with our educational system. We have to work with our businesses. We have to work with our, our uh, healthcare system. Um, and then I think we also have to work with laws. One of the things that I was excited about when I had the opportunity to come here is Fiji is not a large country in the, in the spectrum of countries. Uh, it's, it's a country that has the opportunity to change quicker than we have to change in the United States or Australia. If, if you're a larger country, there's more bureaucracy. And this world desperately needs some countries, and I'm hoping Fiji may be one of those countries, to really step up and implement lifestyle medicine across all of these areas. And, and by doing that, as Dr. Kuma talked about, actually decreasing that curve. I would love, and I, and I think it can happen relatively quickly, if we can reverse diabetes in 12 weeks, a country like Fiji could reverse that curve in three or four or five years. And I would love to come back here in five years and, and say and show the world that we can reverse this. We can, we can decrease this diabetes epidemic and, and Fiji can be the example to the world. One of the ways that can happen is, is by doing laws. And I, I, since I've been here, I learned that there's actually now a new sugar tax. Is that correct? I think that's a great step. One of the best steps that you can take as a society is, is building on those kind of things. And I think there's other ways you can do pro progressive taxation. So, the, so there's education, there, there's uh, laws, there's working with businesses, there's a variety of different things that you can do um, to apply this lifestyle medicine. So in summary, First off, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you all. It's, it's a privilege to be here to, to see the interest in this. Um, lifestyle medicine is an evidence-based um, approach to healthcare that's growing rapidly around the world. Um, if we apply lifestyle medicine correctly, um, we can see disease reversal and we can consistently see that. Um, and the best way to get lifestyle medicine to work is if we really try to change our culture. So we use multiple modalities uh, to, to achieve cultural change and get that curve to be going down. Thank you.